we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you haven't, please find a seat. We have a lot of room in the front. Thanks everyone for coming out to our discussion tonight. Let's talk Chinatown, oral histories of a changing neighborhood. Special thanks to the New York Public Library and especially the staff here at Chatham Square Branch for making this conversation possible. Um, Wing is going to talk a little bit about their Chinatown legacy oral history project before we start. Hi, uh, my name is Wing. I'm a volunteer at the library. Um, so, oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, so my name is Wing, I'm a volunteer at the library, so I'm not sure how many of you know this, but the library has been collecting uh, oral histories as part of its community oral history project. Uh, we've collected over, I believe, 1,200 stories across 18 communities in, China, uh, in New York City, uh, and Chinatown is one of the latest communities that we're collecting stories from. Uh, it started in November, and I think it's going to end in May, where we're going to stop uh, collecting further stories, but these are stories collected by members of the community because it's a community-driven project, so they're not stories collected by professional oral historians. Um, and they're all available on the website. It's at oralhistory.nypl.org. And uh, there are going to be more stories going to be added, uh, I believe, in the next several months. We've collected, but we haven't edited these stories. And these stories are actually very interesting. They're from people who grew up in the neighborhood in the 40s through 60s, so they're very, a little different perspective on uh, what Chinatown was back then. Um, so again, it's nypl, oralhistory.nypl.org. Thank you so much, and I, I would definitely recommend folks to visit the uh, website. There are some really fascinating oral histories up there, and I guess if, you know, if you're interested in contributing, I would talk to Wing afterwards. So as you walked in, uh, we had you answer several questions that focus on four themes specifically. Regeneration, economic development, community work, and the future of Chinatown. These themes will guide our conversation tonight. If you have any questions for the panelists or us, the moderators, uh, that arise at any given point, feel free to write it on the final sheet in the back uh, under questions, or um, you can tweet us your questions using the tag NYPL Chinatown, uh, or WOW one year ANNI, for short for anniversary. So we'll just address any of these questions uh, when we open up the floor for Q&A towards the end. So we're going to turn to some uh, self-introductions, starting with myself, uh, May, and then our panelists. So my name is Diane Wong. I'm currently a doctoral candidate um, and independent ethnographer at Cornell. My dissertation examines the effects of gentrification in Chinatowns across the country. Right, so I write, about the gent I write about gentrification because it provides a useful lens to learn about those who have limited resources and access to formal political institutions engage in politics in their daily lives and also challenge the idea that immigrants are apolitical. Um, in the past year, I've collected over 100 oral histories interviews with residents, organizers, artists, small businesses um, in, the three, in three different Chinatowns, San Francisco, New York City, and Boston. Um, I interviewed May and her family a little bit over a year ago when I first started out this project in New York City, and uh, we've been close friends and collaborators ever since. Great, thanks so much, Diane. Um, thank you so much for coming today. We're really excited to see such a full room. Um, as Diane said, my name is May. Um, I'm currently the owner in training of the oldest operating store in Chinatown called Wing On Wa, um, also known as WOW. Um, I'm also the founder and director of WOW's community initiative called the WOW Project. Um, and we're trying to really bring concerns of a rapidly changing Chinatown into a space for community dialogue. So since May 2016, um, since Diane and I held our first program, um, we've brought together business owners, activists, artists, and labor organizers who root themselves in our neighborhood's history and legacy to build intergenerational bridges of understanding for Chinatown's future. So we're really excited um, about tonight's event as it builds off of one of our very first programs Diane and I collaborated on a year ago uh, when the WOW project was just first beginning and which was very much inspired by the oral history interviews for Diane's dissertation. Um, it's been really moving to be a part of such generative conversations and we're really looking forward to our discussion tonight as being a catalyst for building even more connections and collaborations within our community. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your relationship with Chinatown. So I guess we'll start with Betty to my right and go down the line. Thank you so much. 
Park, Brooklyn, specifically. Um, there's been many generations in my family who have deep roots in Chinatown really quickly. My grandfather was one of the founders of the um, Chinese Hand Laundry um, Alliance, which is a organization that was founded in 1937 here in Chinatown, actually, um, at a tight head of thousand members, and it was a, one of the first labor uh, organizations for, for Chinese immigrants who were all hand laundry uh, owners and workers at the time. Uh, but my own connection is I've been doing labor organizing and um, now housing rights organizing, fighting gentrification with uh, CAV, organizing Asian communities um, for, for many years. Um, and um, I guess I've been an activist for over 20 years since I was a, a teenager. Um, so my whole entire life is, is both Chinatowns, going weaving in and out of the Sunset Park Chinatown and the Manhattan's Chinatown. So thank you for inviting me. Hi everyone, um, I'm Liz Moy. I'm a fourth generation resident of Chinatown. Um, my parents and my grandparents still live on the same block um, where they've always lived, and their business is Noodle Town, or Great New York Noodle Town, um, on the corner of Bowery and Bayard. Uh, I'm a visual artist, and I'm also currently a cultural organizer with the Chinatown Art Brigade. Um, so I've been volunteering some time with CAV uh, to fight gentrification and housing displacement. Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Ng Sao, um, just got married. So um, our, we have a family business in Chinatown for over 40 years. Um, it's called uh, Bo Wing Hong or Bo Wing Hong Food Market. Um, I guess we're kind of a <clears throat> staple in Chinatown for a while now. Um, besides us, I think Ken Man is the oldest supermarket in Chinatown. Um, I am taking over my family's business. I've been back to Chinatown about eight years. I grew up in Chinatown, bagging groceries, um, but actually we moved out to New Jersey. So I'm a New Jersey uh, girl, Jersey girl. Um, I'm deeply involved with the community though. Um, I'm uh, the secretary uh, of, uh, of the board at the Charles B. Vine Community Health Center um, on Canal Street. And um, I'm also part of uh, Kiwanis, uh, CMP, CPC. Uh, my family's deeply rooted into all the organizations in Chinatown. And thank you for inviting me, for, I think, for my second panel. And hopefully I can give you some insight on some business news and gossip. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Lexton Moy. I was born and raised in Chinatown. Um, my parents and grandparents have been at the same apartment um, since the 50s, and they're still there today. I still live in Chinatown, although I've traveled overseas to play uh, professional soccer. I've always returned, and I still call Chinatown my home. So I'm um, proud to be called one of, I guess, the first, uh, not the first, but um, one of the few uh, professional athletes that um, came out of Chinatown. I take a lot of pride in that. Um, I'm currently the um, director of coaching at Chelsea Piers. I run their uh, full entire outdoor travel team program. Um, more specifically, to here in Chinatown, I just recently started uh, a small startup called Synonic, which is a uh, Chinatown clothing company. It's a lifestyle brand, and um, uh, it's currently what we do. So thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Jan. I'm a third generation Chinatown property owner. Um, actually across the street from May is our property. So we, our families have grown up across the street from each other for a long, 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 long time. And uh, um, I just hope to be able to offer a, a certain perspective as property owners. And I think that I'm just fascinated to be on a panel with so many people who have such a long history beyond their own lifetimes. And that's very rare in the city of New York to be in the presence of so many people that are willing to come out, willing to share their time. Um, my business is uh, founded in 1992. I started it at 19 Mott Street, it's called Sinotique, and 
Um, I ran that business at that location until 2008, from 1992 to 2008, in, in conjunction with managing the family property. So um, as a business owner, I have a certain perspective, and as a property owner, I have a certain pr perspective. Um, and it's fascinating that he was, your grandfather was head of the Laundry Association because my family owned the Chinese Laundry at 19 Mock Street. So Chinese hand laundry mm -hmm. and later dry cleaning in the same building. So uh, I think we all come from families that are entrepreneurs. So um, thank you and thank you for having me. Great, so we're gonna just kick off the discussion with our first question. Um, when people think of Chinatown, many think of it as a place to eat dim sum or buy trinkets, but the real reason Chinatowns were formed is political. Chinatowns were created in the United States because of anti-Chinese violence and legal barriers that prevented access to resources, housing, and employment. For many people sitting in this room and on the panel, your families have planted roots here and made Chinatown home for several generations, as we just learned from introductions. So this question is for everyone or whomever would like to answer. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your family history and connection to New York's Chinatown? How is it tied to Chinatown's identity as a neighborhood? And do you have any specific memories that stand out to you today that have influenced you in wanting to stay here? So whoever would like to start can start, um, and then we'll go from there. I'll start. <laughs> um, that was a really long question. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll, uh, multi question. Okay, so we, uh, how we're rooted, um, obviously we have a business. Um, we're not just a supermarket, we um, also supply to restaurants. So we supply um, all over uh, Manhattan, uh, maybe 80% of our Chinatown uh, restaurants uh, order from us, dry goods mostly and uh, Brooklyn Flushing. Um, what kept me in Chinatown, uh, or what made me come back to Chinatown specifically is, um, I think it's just for us, for Boeing Hong at least, like we have a, have, my parents have built such an incredible reputation. Um, we sell such, uh, off like, I wouldn't say high quality, we sell medium to high quality, depending on your uh, price, sorry, what you're looking for. But we, we, we provide authentic products. And I'm not to knock my competitors or knock anybody, but um, you know, a lot of times if, when you go into a uh, uh, Eastern uh, medicine like uh, store, right, like an herbalist, like, uh, you're, sometimes you may not be very, um, you know, be a little bit wary about what you're buying, but um, in this community, we've built up a reputation so that when people um, come to us, like we provide new quality products. And I just grew up in that environment. And it was not until I, after I went to college, came back, and people uh, kept on telling me, you know, you should come back to the family business. And I was like, why? It's a grocery store, right? You know, I have a college degree. I can go elsewhere. But um, to them, I think like our store is a little bit more than that. I think it was just a place that they can, um, it became a destination. Like, okay, uh, people from Sunset Park were like, I'm gonna go to Bowen, I'm gonna buy it. I'm like, okay, great, thank you. But then it wasn't until I really got involved with the business that I was like, you know what? Chinatown has this reputation of having like cheap products and, and you know, and um, you have to haggle your prices and it makes shopping really difficult. And so for me to, pr to continue this business and um, give an opportunity for people to come purchase things and feel comfortable, I think is really important because, um, you know, I go out and I shop at other places and uh, it's scary, uh, you know, imitation is a real thing, you know, imita imitation products is like a real thing. Um, what was the other part of your question? That's good. That's good, okay. <laughs> Um, what, well, I, I, when, when it came time to open my store in Chinatown, um, I started off having uh, smaller items that were pickup items that were a little bit more expensive than what you would find uh, in the rest of Chinatown. And from that, it became actually a home furnishings business. And from the home furnishings, it started to um, sell very high-end antiques, gallery-level antiques. Uh, competing with Park Avenue up to that level of selling very expensive, rare things. 
And the thing that I heard the most was, one, nobody's gonna buy that in Chinatown. Two, it's probably fake. And at the time I was 27 when I opened my business, so I looked like I was even younger. So I, it wasn't very credible that this person was selling high-end items in Chinatown on Mott Street. So I had a lot to overcome. The fact of the matter is, everyone comes to Chinatown. Movie stars come to Chinatown. Hollywood producers come to Chinatown. And I was selling to those people. I had, in the first several years of my business, sold to some of the most influential people in America because they came to Chinatown. So the, the, the challenge that we have in Chinatown is that it's cheap, it's fake, and probably of dubious origin. The, the fact of the matter is, if you provide quality, and you provide service, and you provide a good product, the right people shop. And that's what a lot of entrepreneurs that I've noticed are doing now. After all of the hard work of all of these generations before us, uh, you understand what really is the long-lasting thing. And I was able to sustain my business in Chinatown despite what a lot of naysayers had to say. And I was shocked every day of who is in Chinatown shopping and who's here. So that's one of the reasons I stayed. I could have left after the first two or three years because it was not easy, but I decided to stay and I was grateful that I did. I stayed after 9-11 and that was hard. Um, my parents had a choice of living elsewhere. They decided to stay in Chinatown. Um, they decided to make their home here. A lot of it had to do with convenience. A lot of it had to do with um, knowing a lot of people, like a small village, which a lot of us who have deep roots here know that Chinatown is very village-like. Uh, that's a unique quality that we celebrate. So that's some of the reasons why I stay. First one is how your family is connected and, and why why I'm, why I'm here. I think that um, I think both of us, well, you guys, have spoke about authenticity and um, just the genuine credibility. Um, and I think we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, in short, to answer those two questions is uh, my family is still here um, over I mean decades and decades. So. Um, they, they planted roots here a long, long time ago. Um, my grandfather, uh, my great grandfather got here in the 30s, my grandfather got here in the 40s, and my dad came here in the 60s. Um, and they did um, actually own some buildings and um, property and businesses. And I think my great grandfather, along with my grandfather together, had bought your grandfather's property, I mean, a uh, business, Wing Sang Chung, which was a um, grocery store. Uh, on Mulberry Street, and uh, they had a, a laundromat next door as well. So they they planted roots here a, a long, long time ago, and and the reason why I decided to come back, or um, actually to stay, I don't I don't feel like I've ever left, um, is because of family and community. They they they're here, and uh, hence I'm still here. Um, um, so. Um, well, I'm not a business owner, so I guess I'll just rip off of what uh, Sophia and Jan were saying. I think in terms of like overcoming narratives and what people expect from um, like, Gim Sum and stuff, um, I think there's this expectation that cheap eats are all that Chinatown has, and in ways that plays against like um, like labor, because when people do try to raise their prices, um, not just in competition with other businesses that are opening, but to pay their workers more, it's seen as like so blasphemous that Chinatown doesn't want to offer things for whatever they were offering it for before. Um, my grandfather uh, started Milltown so long ago. It's in a really different iteration than it is now, but yeah, I mean, like Jen was saying, people came to Chinatown way back when, like, when my grandfather was first cooking there, he's now in his 80s, he was like, oh yeah, I served my shrimp and lobster to Barbara Streisand. I was like, that's so cool. Um, and so people were coming back then for food because they knew it was not just cheap, but it was like delicious, it was quality food. Um, yeah, so I just have that to say about uh, cheap eats and labor. So I feel like a little bit like an outlier on this panel because I don't own property. <laughs> I'm not a small business owner or anything like that. Um, I've always been an organizer and activist and that's how I come to Chinatown. Even my grandfather, um, he started this CHLA, right, Chinese Hand Laundry Alliance, 
um, because of the, the, you know, obviously 1882 Exclusion Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act was still in the books, right? So they were organizing um, in 1937, and then the organization went through a decline when the FBI, during McCarthy or McCarthyism, really, um, really, really clamped down on um, anyone they perceived as somewhat like communist or communist sympathetic um, people. So, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, he started it because he cared more about than just himself but he cared about the people around him, um, his community, and at that time was majority men. But he was, yes, he was a worker and he owned his own hand laundry business, but it was literally him and my grandmother, right? It was like two people, right? I'm not talking like big business, with like 10 or 20 or even 30, you know, employers. It was really, employees rather, it was just really him um, and, and, and his wife. Um, so I think that's really different, um, a different narrative. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, um, I have long ties um, in Chinatown. I used to be involved with labor organizing with a group called Chinese Staff and Workers Association many, many years ago. My sister, who has since passed, was um, one of the uh, hunger strikers in front of Jing Fong restaurant in 1995, exposing the exploitative conditions in Chinatown where workers were getting paid 75 cents an hour, working 130 hours a week. And um, because of my sister and a few other people, students who hunger striked, um, they were able to galvanize a lot of support from the community and the workers end up winning back at that time. It was um, a, a, a a record, a precedent setting victory of, of, I believe it was like five or six million dollars of owed back wages in 1997 when they declared a victory. Um, and so there was sort of that sort of passed on to me as well. My parents are garment workers. Um, like I said, my grandmother also worked in garment shops. Um, I think that um, after 9 11, things tra changed drastically. My, both of my parents who worked in Chinatown in garment shops lost their jobs because if anyone remembers after 9-11, there were months where um, trucks couldn't get in um, and it was kind of an excuse for gentrification to start its gears. So you had Lower Manhattan Development Council, a lot of these kinds of corporations that gave money, right, um, and even government aid, right, FEMA, all this money, a lot of it didn't trickle down to the residents, right, the, the working class immigrants in Chinatown who needed it the most, or even the small businesses who needed it the most. It really went to developers. And so what we're seeing now is actually at a result of 9-11, right? It started a few months, a few years after that, and then slowly but surely, about, you know, since 2008, 2009, because of different rezoning laws that were passed, we, we saw all these condos and now over 120 galleries in Chinatown that are not serving the interests of people who live in Chinatown, not serving the, the long-term tenants um, who are Chinese immigrants who cannot afford to buy a $5 coffee, cannot afford to go to a fancy Chinese restaurant and pay $20 for a meal. They just can't do that, right? And so what I'm seeing, the narrative that I'm seeing is that when new businesses come into Chinatown, who is it for and for what goal? You know, and so for me, when I when I talk about coming back to Chinatown, whatever that means, I don't feel like I ever had a choice. It wasn't like a choice, like oh, I'm moving on and up, right? I've always been, you know, I'm a filmmaker, um, I'm a multimedia artist, I'm also now an adjunct professor, but there was never an option for me to like move on up. I don't even know what that means. For me, I just saw the suffering of people like my parents and people in my community. Um, and and, and it, the only right thing to do was actually to come back or, or, or stay here really and fight and say that no, we're here to stay, we're not leaving. Um, and, and so the project Chinatown Art Brigade and the work that we do with CAB is so vital and so integral because it's not just about looking out for oneself, but it's looking out for everyone, your, your comrades, right, your people in your community who are being displaced very violently. So I think that, you know, landlords and gallerists and, uh, uh, you know, um, Property owners, everyone, you know, has a stake in this. Like, what do we do at this point, looking forward, right? With all these plans now, all these new construction plans. I mean, we, we see it, um, it, it, you know, accelerating in rapid speed. So we have to ask ourselves, who is this for, and who do we want to stay here? The Chinatown, you know, we could have fancy gateways and all these things that look really Oriental, right? And to what degree are we just saying we're going to sell our Orientalism because we can get branded? And we can make lots of money, but there'll be no people that live here who are Chinese immigrants or Chinese people who made Chinatown what it is. And so I really think we have to ask ourselves, like, for what, for who, and why? Um, and so, you know, there's never been an option not to, to, to stay here, you know, and to do this work. Yeah, that's a great transition to our next question, which is about the gateway that's about to go up soon. So in the past several years, various individuals and also groups have 
argued for a welcome gateway uh, for New York Chinatown, right? And the argument is that San Francisco has one, Boston has one, Montreal even has one, so why not New York City? Recently, the New York City Department of Transportation, along with Chinatown Partnership, and Van Allen Institute made a call for proposals for a um, Gateways to Chinatown project that is supported by a $900,000 budget. Um, the question, this question goes out to Jan and Sophia and anyone who feels strongly about this. Um, what are your thoughts on the neighborhood marker? What are your thoughts on neighborhood markers such as the Gateway? And do you think that such markers are necessary for New York City's Chinatown? I was actually Hello. I was actually one of the people that fought when this when this proposal was uh, pitched over ten years ago. <clears throat> I was one of the people who fought very much against having an arch. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a certain uh, idea that when you have an arch, uh, well, let me go back. CCDA and its leadership wanted an arch. They wanted a monument to carve their name into somewhere in Chinatown, and they did not have a marble structure to carve their name into, and that was the number one reason why it was being proposed, because the people at this, who were sitting at Chinatown Consolidated Benevolent Association were really adamant for decades to have an arch so that they could commemorate their importance and based on that, uh, I felt very strongly against the fact that that was the purpose of the monument. I didn't think, I think it was the wrong idea. Over the years, it morphed into a gateway idea to mimic the other um, gateways in Chinatowns uh, because it would promote business. That's what was sold to me. It, this will promote business. If you follow along with the thinking of the, it's going to promote businesses, where do you put it? Because if that's what you're doing, you could put it at the corner of Canal and Mott, and business will go there. If you put it at the corner of Mott and Worth, business will go there. Someone's always going to be upset that, from a business standpoint, it wasn't serving them. You're moving the epicenter definition of Chinatown, and that's another reason why I was against it, because an arch symbolizes the epicenter. Who is anyone to say where the epicenter is now or where it's going to be in the future. Um, so the placement of the arch is very controversial. It's still controversial. Um, having sat on Community Board 3 as a public member on their transportation outreach task force, one of the things that we kept trying to struggle with on the map is where to put this thing because there's certain clearances that need to be done. There's certain infrastructure under the sidewalk. There's certain things that need to be considered by the Department of Transportation. I don't know if they have a location pick, but I was recently told that given what's happening to Chinatown, given the fact that Worth Street is being torn up for the next 10 years because a water main is gonna be coming into the Chinatown area, the fact that Mott Street was torn up, completely torn up several years ago for new water main, new fiber optics, new cable communications, all of these things that are coming in. A friend of mine on the corner of Hester and Mott told me none of that infrastructure is for us. That infrastructure is for the next generations of buildings that are on our footprints. So with this in mind, if the civic plan, urban planning, city planning of New York is saying, we will decide once you are gone, once these five story tenements are gone, we'll decide what's going to go there, working with developers, because we're putting infrastructure in now. They'll decide what the epicenter of Chinatown is going to be, and it won't be a Chinatown. Maybe they'll look at Boston's Chinatown, it's minuscule. So, a friend of mine who's equally as long resident in Chinatown said, at least an arch will commemorate the fact that there is a Chinese presence here. It's not so easy to eradicate an entire community. And Chinatowns have disappeared throughout the history of America where there used to be one. So uh, at least having some permanent marker may actually cause some sense of resistance that we can point to that, that this is ours. So I'm, I'm less apt to be so angry and um, forceful against one now, given all of the things that the panel has talked about so far. So I'm, that's how I feel about it. You know, honestly, I'm pretty indifferent because um, 
while I went to school in Boston. So I absolutely, uh, you know, I, I, it, it's very small. It's just Iowa Street, basically, is what Chinatown is. Um, I don't think it would bring any real economic uh, development to Chinatown in terms of, oh, we have tourists now, and now all of a sudden um, we're going to have spring up some businesses to accommodate these tourists. Um, and are those the type of people that we really consume in Chinatown? Um, I don't have the answer for that, but I can, I'm guessing it's no. Because, for example, in my building, um, the fourth, third, fourth, and fifth floors used to be garment factories. Um, the third floor is still a garment factory, um, is the only remaining one, and the fourth and fifth floor are now a shared, like a wee workspace, where it's called, uh, uh, yeah, it's based or something. Uh, beautiful, it's beautiful inside, but it's, it's funny because um, in Chinatown, uh, in my business, specifically in my location, we don't even, we didn't have, we don't have BIOS. We don't have any type of like high speed internet. I mean, I'm basically on dial up, right? But it wasn't until this WeWork space came in, uh, base came in on the fourth and fifth level, that now Time Warner put in BIOS. It's like, yes, awesome, I can tap into that, but why is that, right, in Chinatown, where, you know, um, now this, uh, did you say the water, uh, water, water main? Yeah. is now being built in Chinatown? Is it for us, or was it for someone else who came into our neighborhood? Because we can thank maybe gentrification for that. I mean, I thank them for bringing me FIOS, finally. But, you know, where does that, um, you know, what kind of balance does that strike? When, when there were garment factories in my building, they all shopped at my store, right? And we were able to keep more employees, right? But now, I mean, it's, we're, it's a struggle. I mean, um, it's a real struggle um, to find, uh, to find uh, quality people and, and to find customers in Chinatown. You know, our, um, the population is aging so rapidly and very few young families come to Chinatown because of this poor infrastructure that we have. They can't even go online. I mean, they can't even have access to, um, you know, running water constantly, you know? I mean, uh, it's, it's a struggle. So um, having a symbolic, you know, Chinatown, whatever, it doesn't mean anything to me if um, there's no community anymore. Does anyone else want to add anything? Um, I can say something personally. Um, I feel like I feel like gates are a way for the city to make a fake gesture that uh, they're interested in the preservation of your community and neighborhood. Um, but I think preservation is often a euphemism for like histor historicization in a bad way, where we're going to preserve what we imagine Chinatown to be and what it used to be and like all these um, object and material based documents of what it used to be but we're not going to acknowledge how it's changed and grown since then and so like Sophia was saying it's for tourists it's this marker for them um, to acknowledge that they're in Chinatown although I can look around and see Chinese people and Chinese businesses and know oh I'm in Chinatown you know like we've been here over a century I don't know why we need a gate to say that we're here, um, and besides the controversy over the placement, I just think gates can be very othering. Um, in other cities, you know, the Chinatowns, like Jan said, they're depleted. Um, in Boston and DC, they're also facing really intense housing and displacement crises that, you know, it's kind of a cruel joke that there's $900,000 going to this single object when it could be going to other things that the community needs way more. Okay. <laughs> Just to add on to that, um, actually, what you what you said was a great point. This is the aha. We're in Chinatown, right? This is the marker when you enter Chinatown. But is that also the end of Chinatown? The marker to end Chinatown, right? Because in uh, when I was in school in Boston, that was the controversy. Um, there was rezoning in in Boston, and they limited how Chinatown can expand. You know. Isn't, isn't that a little bit racist, right? I can have a business and I can be, have Chinese lettering. Is that considered Chinatown? But I mean, that was the reality of it when I was in school in Boston. And I, uh, when, you, when you mentioned, is that the beginning or end or the placement of Chinatown? It absolutely, that marker in Boston is the yes. end of Chinatown on Tyler Street because then after that, it's um, a, a bus station. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I went, the only time I left Chinatown was briefly to go to college in Boston, and 
it was really scary for me to experience that Chinatown because I didn't understand why it was like that. Um, because the feeling of it, the fabric felt so different than what I knew here at home. Um, but yeah, it's as the city is going through Mayor de Blasio's rezoning plans, this gate, I think it's supposed to be placed where um, like Mul Mulberry or Baxter and Canal or Walker in that area. I mean, I don't see that as an end or start point to Chinatown. It seems very oddly placed and it's also centering core Chinatown, like what it used to be back when our first generations were here. So like Bayard, not Mulberry, and it doesn't really extend to what we now see as Chinatown, which is part of the Lower East Side, um, where it's heavily uh, residentially Chinese um, and Asian populations. If I could add on to exactly what you're saying. Um, on this panel alone are people who have very strong opinions and very deep history and a lot of great reasons about where or whether or not an art should be placed. But if you notice, we weren't considered. This was considered by a business improvement district the business improvement district, which was opposed in great part by Chinatown, is what's deciding in a closed room the location of this arch. So with people just in this panel who had such deep roots and such understanding, and if you can identify that that's an odd place, your opinion didn't matter because that opinion about where it's gonna be placed wasn't up to us. This was a small panel of a business improvement district. And this is why I have a long history of opposing business improvement districts throughout the city. There's 70 of them. When business improvement districts form, they have power that takes away from stakeholders like us and residents, because residents are not a voting member of any business improvement district in the city. So when people were saying that business improvement district in New York will clean the litter off of the sidewalks and business improvement districts will, will clean some gum wrappers away from the sidewalk, they're also co-opting important decisions like this that are permanent. And I just wanted to add that because the fact that we're here and we have a lot to say, we have a lot of great opinions, doesn't matter. We have a business improvement district in Chinatown and that's what makes the decisions for us. Can I this do better your mind? Do you want to tell people what a business improvement district is, just in case people don't know? Or is that irrelevant? Um, yeah, you can if you don't know business improvement districts, there are 70 of them throughout the city. Business improvement districts, by virtue of who forms them, are usually large businesses. And um, they supposedly work with communities to work as quasi-governmental entities which forcibly take tax dollars from every single building in that district. So the first thing to do is draw a line around the district you wish to form a business improvement district, and every single building in there has to reply with a yes or a no vote. It's extraordinarily difficult to do, to reg register your no vote. I know because I was the one who tried to get all of my property owners together we succeeded in registering the largest number of no votes in the history of, of bids in New York City, and we still were not heard by the council member, by the city council, by the mayor, and by city planning. This thing happened, and it happens in neighborhoods all over New York City in the five boroughs. So as we talk about gentrification, as we talk about as much as we try to do to, pre to get our voices heard, beware the business improvement district. It is usually, the entity that will override all of the residents and all of the small uh, businesses. Because whether you want to be in it or not, you're in it. And not to say that after 9-11, bid came in strong into Chinatown, and so you see that pagoda kiosk thing that no one's ever in on Baxter. Oh, that information, um, information kiosk, um, it's horrible. It's like, I don't know why it's there, it doesn't need to be there, it's taking up space. Um, doesn't help people because no one's there and there's a map that like is, re is irrelevant and hasn't been updated forever But what I was gonna say is that I think when we, when we within um, Chinatown Art Brigade or CAB talk about gentrification We actually talk about it more as displacement because what bid says is oh, we're improving, you know We're revitalizing we're beautifying. Yeah, everybody deserves to live in a neighborhood that is beautiful Right that 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 has the amenity that we all benefit from but 
it should not also displace people who are currently living there. So any any city, any neighborhood that you look at in the city, when you see a bid come in, that's like the beginning of the end. Like Sunset Park, where I grew up, Long Island City, Bushwick, Harlem, you name it. It's like, it comes, it's the beginning of the end for working class folks and small businesses who actually made that neighborhood what it is, like Chinatown. It's like folks for generations made it what it is, and now this infrastructure is, is really being like literally ripped up from under us. And I just have to say that, um, you know, with, the, with, with what you were talking about with the Gateway Project, and you know, I think that one thing that um, is, is sometimes, it's like we're so focused on that, which I get, we're opposed to it, which is important, and I shouldn't say we, but as an individual, I don't, I don't want to speak for anyone else, um, obviously it's diverting money away uh, from, from other needed services in the community, but also we have to remember that there are um, plans like uh, the Chinatown Working Group, right, of uh, 50 organizations that came together over an eight year period um, because the 2008 rezoning plan decided um, to protect the East Village but not Chinatown and they, Chinatown was up for grabs and now we're seeing all these massive changes and displacement. But there is, there are proactive forces where people are fighting for a plan that would protect tenants, that would protect um, the residents now and would protect small businesses. Um, so I do think that in this time of like being reactive and what we're against, we do need to like talk about what is out there and um, you know not let those divisive forces pit us, us us against one another. Because I have to say one more thing is that the rezoning plan is not just about Chinatown; it's about the Lower East Side too. It's about the waterfront because the waterfront and the Lower East Side, as we know, where Two Bridges is, there is the most massive, <laughs> ugly luxury, you know, right. There's Extel, JDS, and I always forget the other one. But, right, they've already sold all their apartments, mainly to Shanghainese um, business owners who will only live there once a month, probably. So we have to understand that, um, you know, when we talk about Lower East Side and Chinatown, we're not just talking about Chinatown, we're talking about the Lower East Side, too, that makes Lower Manhattan what it is and to have a united front. So there are plans out there, but certain people are pushing just to protect the Chinatown core, and we can't allow them to pit us against one another, right? That, you know, we all have the same interests and, and we, need to, we need to remember and we have to advance toward that common interest and goal, so. Definitely, um, thanks so much for all those answers and perspectives, we really appreciate it. Um, and kind of on the same note of, you know, coalition building and resilience, we wanna ask a question about, you know, the generations of organizers, activists, artists, collectives, and movements. So this question is for Lexin, Betty, and Jan. Lexin, you're the founder of Synonic, Chinatown Clothing Company. Betty, you're the co-founder of the Chinatown Art Brigade. And Jan, you're the founder of Sinotique, which started on Mott Street. Can each of you share with us the kind of creative work that you do and how it informs your relationship to Chinatown or vice versa? Can we also direct this question, can we also direct this question at Liz, who I know has done a lot of great work with galleries in Chinatown? So um, just earlier on this year, I started um, Synonic. Uh, I've been sitting on this idea for um, quite some time now. And um, I think it came about as I started doing uh, web development and design work. And um, as I was playing, I was thinking about, well, what can I do when I get back um, to New York and Chinatown? And um, my inspiration, I think, the, what it started with was I, I, I love t-shirts. I had this t-shirt that was like from Ralph Lauren or something. It had some Chinese characters on it. It had some vague, um, others had like vague designs that really weren't true and authentic to what it really meant. And so I was like, all right, maybe I could do some design that touches upon um, a genuine part of Chinatown rather than go to these big box stores and say, hey, look, put a Chinese character on it. Why, why can't it be just genuine and authentic to, to the location? And so I played around with some words and, and some, we know Sino Teak, Jen has, has, has used the, the prefix Sino. Um, so I, I, I spelled it C-Y-N-O and uh, NYC, of course, is New York City. You know, when you put the two together, it becomes synonic, which is undeniably China and NYC, and, and so that's my creative word for uh, anything pertaining to Chinatown. And uh, I guess the, the beginning goal was to have um, uh, products that 
one was created here and the subject matter uh, be of the community. Um, so I'm hoping that, that I could provide uh, a different outlook um, of original contact, uh, content because Chinatown you know, really is so rich. We, there's a lot of artistic urban aspects that are unique to this one location. You know, there's Chinatowns in San Francisco, Brooklyn, and, and um, Queens, and all of other states, but there's only one Chinatown, New York City, that's Manhattan. So I wanted to put all those design concepts together and, and uh, hopefully create a product that people could say, hey, look, this is genuine. This is the story behind it. It's, it's not just uh, a design firm that's from elsewhere coming in and tap into this cultural, rich cultural history. And so, um, the uh, our motto is delivering heritage and tradition. Um, I restored a 1950 Ford uh, milk truck, and that's the uh, that's the, the, the devel um, delivering aspect of the brand, whereby um, I could take it to the streets, that the mobile marketing piece, and um, tap into not only the history and tradition of Chinatown because. We each have different experiences of that. Um, so I'm not really trying to define what that is, but to open up the conversation for other artists and people who could relate to the, to, to the subject matter and open up the conversation to say, well, what is the history of Chinatown? What is that? What is your family connection? What is your experience growing up or even moving into Chinatown now? And what are the, the, the traditions that we had or are now creating uh, as a community. So that, that's a little bit about what Sinonic is and, and the brand. As I said earlier, I, um, I started Sinotique in 1992 and uh, I sat across the dining room table with my dad and we wrote down on a piece of paper how to come up with different names and we invented the word Sinotique. So um, it was interesting uh, in its development, as I said, it started off doing uh, smaller objects that were carryaways and then eventually made, uh, through the course of its uh, years, doing much higher end and much more interesting things. The interesting thing is that you might say, well, this was a store that was only for outside people. Obviously, this was a store that's just for tourists. Obviously, this is a store for uptown people. This was not a store for us. And actually, and I can tell you because I was the one selling, there was a tremendous amount of uh, indigenous consumership. And I think that that's an important thing, regardless whether we're talking about groceries or we're talking about restaurant supplies or we're talking about where you get your eyeglasses, the Chinatown community is constantly, constantly underrated for its consumership. Um, there is so much money spent in Chinatown by Chinatown, Chinese people that we know as business people if we don't have an indigenous consumership for our businesses, we will fail. And so the, the, the businesses that rely 100% on tourism, so t-shirt shops and trinket shops that used to be pervasive on Canal Street and they're slowly disappearing because we don't shop there, our people in our families don't shop there. So. Again, the Business Improvement District mantra is we need more tourists. And if you build an arch, you'll get more tourists. If you pick up gum wrappers in the street, you'll get more tourists. Tourists would be happier if you spoke English. Tourists would be happier if the menu was English. Uh, we shouldn't have signage in Chinese anymore. So I went through all of that because it was directed at me because I was a business owner and I was the recipient of a lot of this type of criticism. But in actuality, the Chinatown people have, for generations, start making money, and they still stay here. They wanted nice things. And so from the smallest to the, to the highest price items, we still were able to sustain. And I think that that's something, as a, as a business person, I wanted to get across, that um, don't believe the narrative of any of these people because it'll always be proven false. There's always something that will surprise the hell out of you about the demographic that we live in, that we sell to, that we work with, that we have as our tenants. And um, there is no one Chinatown demographic, is I guess my point, that I've learned. And it surprised the hell out of me as a person who was selling these things in Chinatown. So, um 
So uh, about a year and a half ago, I guess, um, Mansi, myself, and Tamir Arai, who is an amazing artist. Um, if you don't know her, you should look her up. Uh, she's done all the sort of um, historical murals in Chinatown. They are now all gone because of gentrification. Those buildings aren't here anymore. The famous one being, there's one on, um, was on um, music, uh, on Hester, where Wyndham, um, you know, Wyndham Hotel is now. There used to be Music Palace, right? Um, and her mural, a uh, wall of respect for working people, was on that wall. Um, and it was named one of the top, like, uh, you know, sort of murals of all time in New York City. Um, so look her up if you don't know who she is. But anyway, the three of us basically have, um, you know, sort of deep, deep roots in Chinatown, Manhattan's Chinatown. Manti had been organizing, were there? <laughs> had been organizing with CAF for over 12 years and specifically been doing a lot of work with the Chinatown Tenants Union. Tamiya Rai, who helped start like Basement Workshop and Godzilla and some of these other artist collectives, and I had been involved with um, different um, different labor and immigrant rights struggles, and also as an artist and filmmaker, had been involved with work for for many many years, and we all had been involved with CAV, uh, Chinatown, uh, the Chinatown Tenants Union, um, and I think at that time, a couple of years ago, uh, we were seeing this. It was just an acceleration of gentrification or displacement, we should say. More and more um, tenants were coming forward. Um, to expose their landlords, those, those particular landlords, not all, <laughs> but those particular slumlords, I call them, who were just making life miserable, right, to displace people um, in these tenement buildings. I mean, just to give you some statistics, in about 12 years, uh, between the Lower East Side and Chinatown, 30,000 units of affordable housing have been lost. Um, construction has uh, jumped up 1,000% since 9-11. Um, we've lost about 25 to 30% of the Chinese population since 9-11 in Chinatown. So these are all coming from this rezoning, um, this Chinatown working group plan that I'm talking about, where these are the facts. This is what's happening in our community. And so CAV, a couple of years ago, said, you know, we want to figure out other ways to actually reach out to tenants and organize tenants and ha create platforms for people to tell their own stories. And so the three of us as artists and media makers um, decided that we wanted to figure different ways to, to um, tell people's stories, not only of resilience, but of resistance, that people are not afraid. They are coming forward, they are fighting back, regardless of their documentation status, right? Regardless of all those things, whatever is stacked up against them, that they're exposing their, they're gonna expose like these conditions and their landlords. And so um, I can't remember, I think it was Mansi's idea, like, oh, wouldn't it be great to do these projections at night? Um, and, um, sorry, Nancy, I'm calling you out. Um, and, you know, we collaborated with a co uh, collective called The Illuminator, and The Illuminator is got has become world-renowned now because of Occupy Wall Street. So they're the ones that were projecting the 99% bat signal. Anyway, some of you might be looking at me like I have five heads, but <laughs> they were the ones that do, were doing all the evening projections to this day. They were an activist collective. And I knew many of them, I'm friends with them, so we, you know, collaborated with them. And in the last two years, we've done several projections at night on walls um, in Chinatown, right? Um, and, and the most significant part of this is that these messages are co-created by residents and tenants of the community. It's not as if we're artists parachuting in saying, this is, this is what we should do, right? So over a course of uh, eight weeks, we did cultural production workshops. So through placekeeping walks, where tenants and residents actually led us on significant parts of, of their journey and their life in Chinatown, like the garment factory that one woman who um, is a member of Chinatown Tennis Union used to work at. Now it's a luxury gym. You know, another person who stopped at a spot where it was about to be turned into a gallery that was a bakery. So all these places, that, that these memories, right, it's very hard sometimes to even talk about it. So walking was really therapeutic and cathartic for us to walk and see those places and for them to tell their stories as a way to honor their story and the memories, but that we're also going to have to fight and we're fighting and we're here to stay. So through um, community mapping and drawing and audio podcasting and photography and all these various uh, ways of documentation, we came up with messages to project on walls at night. So that's where the messages like, you know, were, you know, getting, get, you know, trying to get other tenants to get involved. So messages in Chinese and English and Spanish, like, do you know your tenant rights? 
Do you know you have rights to protect yourself against landlord harassment? Do you know that there are groups like CAB that you can reach out to to get involved? Do you know there's a rezoning plan? All these things. So our first like uh, target audience what were tenants. We're tenants trying to get other tenants involved in the work. And the second, honestly, was was gentrifiers and gallerists, which I'll let Liz talk about. But you know, and then and then the final thing was you know uh, yeah sure you know developers we wanted them to know that p there are people organizing and they're going to fight back. Uh, but we wanted also city council members to know and the mayor to know that we know that there's a Chinatown working group plan that's it, it, that's 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 right there that would actually protect people um, and we want them to pass it and so we were trying to hit three major targets in our in our projections and now our cultural work is going to take other iterations which you know stay tuned to find out but um, but but it started out with the projections and it's been really um, amazing to see all these different folks pipe in and get involved um, but maybe Liz can talk about the gallery organizing work. I know your favorite. <laughs> yes, my favorite. Um, it's been a really weird couple years for me, thinking about the legacy of arts and culture in Chinatown. Um, I actually remember Jan's store, uh, Cenotique, uh, his Mott Street location, which I used to play in when I was a child with his niece. Although it's as much as you can play around homewares and antiques, so mostly just staying put and talking with my friends. Um, but also thinking about, uh, I went to art school, which I guess wasn't a strange choice for me, and my family didn't uh, raise their ears in it or didn't think it was weird. They were fully supportive. Um, but thinking about arts in Chant, and I've now had to like learn and unlearn a lot of things. Because um, when I got to college, I mean, there was all this privilege, and I was just very confused because I started to get the impression that people uh, who moved here for college thought that I lived fundamentally different from them because I lived in Chinatown because I was from Chinatown. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I just have any like normal childhood. I like live with my family. Um, and so it was then that I started to see how people see it differently. Um, people, my peers in school, they were like, oh, we're gonna go to this cool underground gallery spot. It's a pop-up show. It's in this really grimy spot downtown. It was like around the corner from my house, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what the fuck are we talking about right now? Um, and so, in the past five years, I started to see these spots that these people were talking about, and I started to document them because they were growing uh, in number so quickly. And so, I started just mapping the galleries that I would see, and there are now 125, like within what people in Chinatown consider Chinatown Lower East Side two bridges. Um, obviously there's some on, on the outskirts, but you know, Eldridge has like 14, 15 galleries right now. Grand Street has 15 as well. Um, and there, there are more coming because a lot of white people and a lot of white media is portraying this as the new arts district. But in fact, we've had arts here for a really long time as um, my other panelists have been talking about. Um, but I had to unlearn this very like white art institution sanctioned um, idea of what art was because I was just looking at contemporary art in galleries and museums. And then I went to this show at MoCA that was about basement workshop. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. These people like collected stuff from all these businesses here and there were all these artists. And I like went home to my parents and I was like, did you guys know that there was this thing called basement workshop? They're like, yeah, Liz, we were in it. Like, <laughs> And obviously, um, in Chantan Art Brigade, there was one of the founding members of Basin Workshop, Tomia Arai. Um, my parents joined later in the 80s when they were trying to figure out more ways to connect to the community, and that involved uh, decentralizing the art aspect of it. So they did childcare, and they started things like Field Day in Columbus Park, um, which were just like community gathering events. And so my parents didn't think about it in that respect, oh, this is an art collective. They were like, we're just helping our community go on as it is. Um, so just, I had to unlearn a lot because I was so embarrassing to go to them and frame it that way. Like, Did you know about this art collective? And they were like, stop talking. Um, so yeah, ever since I've been documenting these galleries and I joined Chinatown Art Brigade um, to start to volunteer my time with CAV to help the tenants, um, I didn't really understand how I could use my skill set and um, the ways I've been documenting and making work um, to put it towards actual purposeful use. Um, so that's just been how I think about art in Chinatown, and how I've had to really reframe it for myself and hopefully get other people who don't understand Chinatown to see it that way as well.
So this panel is incredibly diverse in that many of you are longtime residents, small property owners, organizers, and wear multiple um, and often conflicting hats at once. And it seems as though the conversation around displacement and housing in Chinatown is often single dimensional in that um, landlords are often portrayed with a single broad brush. Um, but we know that predatory landlords, right, like Laurel Do Properties, uh, Mayflower, James Fong, aren't the same as Chinese immigrants who've been in the neighborhood and have, um, have been in here for generations. So this question goes out to Jen and Betty, right? What are some ways that we can complicate uh, the narrative about the relationship between tenants and landlords in Chinatown? And I know that Jen, you have several slides. Yeah, uh, this would um, be a good time to show. Jen, if you don't mind showing, okay. Yeah, let's, uh, <laughs> let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Uh, one more up. Yeah, let's stay with this one. Um, oh, where do I start, guys? Okay. <laughs> You mentioned a couple of really nasty landlords, and there's a list. There's a list of nasty landlords. There's actually a formal list of nasty <laughs> landlords. That list is touted out every time a politician wants more votes. That list exists because it is a political list. That list is a narrative that is held up as the hard work that politicians do to protect the citizens of New York, while in actuality, it is just smoke and mirrors. There are many, many, many laws protecting people in New York already from harassment, and the redoubling of harassment laws is sort of like giving somebody two parking tickets because they parked in the same place on the same day. It, they're redundant. The redundancy is great for lawyers who represent tenants because they are there for that purpose. The redundancy is great for judges who sit on benches because they're voted in by tenants. All the people who control the laws regarding tenants are um, put there either by the mayor or they're voting in judges that are very pro-tenant. So it's, it's, it's something that you think are protecting you. Well, actually, there's a machine that's in place that works against the two interests the small property owner and the tenant to keep them on adversarial parts. I wanted to bring with me a chart that shows you work that I've done personally to accumulate all of the taxes on Mont Street, Doyer Street, Pell Street, Chatham Square, Bowery, Bayard, Mulberry, basically the core of Chinatown. And what you'll see are the overall average taxes paid in Chinatown, and it goes all the way up to past $75,000 into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. What's significant is we were in a recession in 2008. I closed my store in 2008. Many Chinatown stores closed in 2008 and have never returned. Um, I have dear friends who've closed 80-year-old businesses, 90-year-old businesses since I started my business. The city's response was to raise taxes and raise them and raise them again. And you'll see what, how steep that climb is. That's something that you, how many people have seen this graph before? So that's an indication of a one-sided argument. That means that while people have been directing their ire at the property owner is doing this and the property owner is doing that and they're, they're selling out to these types of businesses, the actual culprit is the city of New York because knowing that there was mass vacancies, knowing that the banks were being bailed out, knowing that so many people were going through the exact same thing, their response was to do that to the whole city of New York and to do it again and to do it again. If you could switch then to the next slide of, so this again shows the median and it's an upward climb. Do you think the commercial as well as residential Well. Uh, taxes are only based on block and lot, and the taxes that you pay cannot be put onto your rent-controlled and rent-stabilized tenant. And that's very significant in Chinatown because the vast majority of tenements are rent-controlled and rent-stabilized. So who bears the burden of that increase that the city of New York is doing? It's the commercial tenant, because that's the only source of income for that block and lot. If you're an unlucky property owner and you have one commercial tenant, that one commercial tenant bears the brunt of that.
from year to year to year to year. That's why when 10-year leases come up, the next person has to make that up somehow. Can you go, Jen, to the slide with water? So we're a, we're a, we are a community of restaurants. We are a community that people have branded where to come to eat. Well, to keep restaurants going requires water and sewer, a lot of it. This is what the city's response is. If you go all the way to 2008, we fell into a depression, a, a, a recession that was comparable to the depression in 29. That's what the city utility companies have done. So how do those restaurants cope? The tax base has, is going up yearly. The only one to pay the tax is the commercial tenant. At the same time, they're trying to keep their small businesses open, and that's what the water prices are happening. So the narrative that you've been hearing, property owners are driving everyone out, property owners are selling out Chinatown, property owners are the ones who are causing this problem. In actuality, because I actually formed a group of property owners when we were trying to oppose the Chinatown Business Improvement District, the one thing that it did was it brought small property owners together. And what we realized is that small property owners actually have the legacy of their families in mind when they wanted to preserve their properties. And the more and more pro uh, property owners I talked to, the more and more I learned that in fact they lowered the rents, they froze the rents, they, they didn't uh, honor what their leases said, which is a built-in 3%, 4%, 5% increases. In many respects, when the recession hit, a lot of commercial rents were frozen from the restaurants that were paying 20,000 a month to people who were paying 1,000 a month. A lot of property owners in Chinatown had no choice but to just keep their existing tenant because this recession after the first year, no one knew what was gonna happen. And so they preserved the small businesses. That will never happen when the small property owners of Chinatown leave. And that's why the city is actually the biggest culprit in the selling out of Chinatown in the flight of Chinatown property owners, in the reason why there's so much loss happening. The city of New York has politicians that will always say that we're, we're changing the laws for harassment. We're on your side, tenants. In actuality, this is what's happening. And that's the quiet thing that the city can get away with. Because as long as there's people on two sides of the table fighting and fighting and fighting, those taxes, those assessments, all of the infrastructure that gets built, all gets paid for by us. And so if I had anything to leave you with, I would say the conversation, anytime we're talking about the preservation of Chinatown, the finger has to be pointed squarely at the mayor and at the politicians who are in control of the Rent Guidelines Board, of the Water Board, of the MTA, and all of those things that work in consort to make it harder for us to hold, to keep businesses and to pay taxes. Because big development doesn't care about those increases. Big development can pay taxes. Big development can pay for water. They can pay for anything the city has to dish out for them because the apartments will merit that, co that cost. And so, did I bring one more slide? I'm not sure. No, no. Oh, oh, that was no, just the one of the core. Um, that was just showing the core of, the, of my study area. So I'm accumulating data on, on my own because I don't see it. I don't see it when people are telling me that taxes are going up. I don't see it when people tell me that Chinatown is changing. I need the data to show politicians, to show Margaret Chin, our councilwoman, to show the city council of New York. We are under threat and they are to blame. This is not, the fact that none of you know that this is happening is indicative of the fact that this is a narrative that is purposely made one-sided, as you started off the conversation to say. It is a one-sided narrative. So if we could all come together to point the finger where it really needs to be pointed, and not at individual small property owners, but at developers and the city who is complicit in designing this system to always push the small property owner out. That is the goal, and it is, it's something that we should always keep in mind. So, um, it's funny that 
that this came up because we've been within within our organizing group we've been talking about having to do some power mapping what are the the big forces and certainly city planning is like the big one right and then the, and then the, the banks and the real estate um, developers um, but I definitely want to say that you know um, I think that you know, oftentimes small landlords are pitted against, you know, tenants for sure. And now that you're looking at Mayor de Blasio's plan, his three-year plan, four-year plan that he unveiled last year, which was to rezone 15 neighborhoods completely. And I think that we have to always remember when we talk about Chinatown that obviously we're not in a vacuum, right? We, are, we, we, sh we can't see ourselves as isolated. There were many people in Chinatown, when we talk about here to stay, some of them were like, we had no choice, we got this place, we, where are we? we can't stay, we, we gotta go. So they go to Sunset Park, but then Sunset Park is being rezoned, like where my parents are living. They're also talking about a gateway thing that is gonna be built in the fall. It's actually gonna happen. It's already happening uh, right on the corner of where my parents live. Um, and they hate it. They're, they're gonna hate what that means for, for, for them. Um, and so when we talk about these things, we have to obviously have to understand how, how it affects the satellite Chinatowns and other boroughs, which is other working class communities of color, right? I mean, we work with groups that are out in East New York and they talk about, oh, affordable housing coming to East New York. You know, but meanwhile, you have to make 65,000 for it to be affordable. You have the average income in East New York, a family makes 27,000 a year, that's the average. The average family in Chinatown makes 37,000 a year, right? And then you see rents now, obviously in these new developments, are as high as four or $5,000 a month for a one, two bedroom apartment. Who, who can afford them? You know, I'm talking about these new, new condos that are coming up. Um, and I think for us, um, when we talk about the systems of gentrification, um, we're not only just talking about that individual, that gentrifier or that artist that's coming in. I mean, us as artists, we, we understand and we're sensitive to the fact that the first line or the first wave of gentrific gentrification is often the galleries, the art groups, the artists that come in. Um, but these galleries in Chinatown also know if they're not careful, look what happened to Soho, right? In Soho in the 80s, affordable space, and all of a sudden, now you have all these big box stores. No one remembers those galleries that had affordable rent. And that's what's gonna happen uh, to Chinatown. Um, and I think that there's like layers upon layers, right? You, we talk to some of these galleries, and they're like, oh, we're, you know, we're trying to live hand to mouth. And we're like, no, you really don't know, you really do not know what it means to live hand to mouth. Like you don't, <laughs> right? Like you're paying already 25, 30,000 for your 500 square foot little gallery space, okay? So you don't know what that means. I mean, literally you have these two tales of Chinatown where you have people who have a white box that no one goes in, right? And they all they have to do is sell three pieces of, of artwork a month and they're good. Um, and then right next door to them, you have people who are living in really, really, really poor conditions. Um, and I think that, you know, of course there's different interests on this panel, which I totally respect. You know, but I think for us, I mean, we do see that, you know, tenants at the end of the day, immigrant tenants in Chinatown or in any community, but we're talking about Chinatown now, are the hardest hit when it comes to gentrification and displacement. You really can't deny that when people are living, you know, in these kind of conditions. I mean, we, we hear with through Cab and Chinatown Tenants Union, you have 80-year-old um, tenants, most of them are elderly, right? who are living in these apartments and landlords looking to push them out as fast as they can. They turn up the heat in the summer, an 80 year old man where who's living in like a 100 degree box in the summer because they, they turn up the heat in the summer, right? And, and there's not adequate you know, uh, 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 water and not adequate um, um, heat in the winter. Um, so these are things that are true. These are absolutely true. And I do think that we do have to get past that narrative of like s sort of small landlord, small property owner um, versus these tenants. I mean, there are the predatory ones, no doubt that, you know, CAV and other tenant groups are fighting, tenant rights groups. But I do think that um, at the end of the day, we do have to really acknowledge who are the most hit, hardest hit people in this community who, who really have no other place to go. I mean, businesses, galleries, they can go somewhere else, right? Not to say that we should, right? Uh, but I do, I do think that there's something to say about having a united front among small businesses, small landlords, and tenants. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, I mean, it, we're 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 losing the we're losing the it sound, seems like we're losing the battle. But um, um, I think that you know, instead of pitting us against one another, um, we have to see that we have more in common than we than we have differences. To be honest, um, I don't know. If there's... Um, I guess I'll just add a no. I feel like. Yeah, so in a city grappling with such extreme homelessness and displacement, it's just really important to be thoughtful about where you're living no matter where it is. I'm 
I mean, obviously, a lot of young people are looking to communities of color for their cheaper rents, but a lot of them think it's a stepping stone uh, for, you know, just the beginning of their 20s where they're going to eventually make more money and eventually go on to better housing accommodations. Um, so yes, totally in agreement with what Jan said, that the city is completely, um, belligerently so full of power and money that they can make these huge decisions without community input um, and are definitely the number one uh, agents of displacement. But you can be not a property owner um, and be a gentrifier and also be an agent of displacement. A lot of gentrifiers don't understand the difference or can't distinguish between a need and a convenience. Oh, I need my Uber. Oh, I need my coffee. Oh, I need healthy food available near me, AKA just grain bowls and salads. Um, and for that, they become the foot soldiers for developers because developers see these needs, these needs, conveniences, that people are voicing their concerns about very publicly. Um, and they're like, oh, we can make this happen for you. Like, we're gonna bring this to your community, your neighborhood now. Um, so I just, people need to be really wary of that and see how it plays into this larger structure of the city being able to take property like this and be able to displace um, tenants and long-term residents. Awesome, thank you so much for your responses. Um, we're moving into our last final question for the night um, before we go into Q&A. Uh, this is for everybody, so maybe we can start with Sophia and Lexton. Um, given our conversation on the changes in the neighborhood and the fact that all of us here have agency in shaping its future, which is very apparent from this conversation, um, where do you hope to see Chinatown in 10 years from now? Um, and how do you see yourself as being a part of it or being a part of this vision of your 10 years from now future Chinatown? Listening to all of your perspectives is actually very enlightening, so I appreciate all of um, these excellent viewpoints. Um, as a business owner um, and a supplier to many restaurants in Chinatown, um, I've noticed that there's really not much innovation, right, compared to other uh, other towns like uh, Flushing, right? They have um, they have food offerings that we don't have in Chinatown, right? And I feel like as, um, you know, as a consumer of uh, all goods in Chinatown, restaurants, and, and I purchase many things in Chinatown, I really feel like I don't have many options. And that's uh, partly due to the fact that uh, small businesses can't uh, have a really good footing in Chinatown because of the high rent, right? So as uh, in my company, for example, we've adapted, you know, we've spruced up the store a little bit. We try to maintain a good presence. But I feel like a lot of businesses in Chinatown don't, uh, don't have that initiative, or maybe they don't have that uh, resource. You know, Maybe um, their kids uh, don't want to take over the business and they have no website. You know, these, are these are things that I feel are very uh, indicative to just business, right? Business development. And um, you know, in 10 years, I don't know if uh, we'll be in Chinatown. I mean, we still have, we have a great landlord, by the way. Uh, he's he's uh, Chinese. Um, um, but without everybody's participation in the community, you know, um, joining, uh, joining organizations, like, I mean, I'm kind of a cross in between, right? I can kind of toggle in between. Um, I'm very good, uh, as Laura will know, I'm very, you know, I'm uh, very um, active in the, uh, the establishments that have been in Chinatown that helped Chinatown, maintain Chinatown. I mean, I have to give them credit, a lot of them credit for really, um, you know, spearheading a lot of initiatives to, um, uh, you know, to get funding into Chinatown. And we really do have to give our elders, you know, some credit for that. Um, and I think there may be some sort of a lack of communication or maybe a communication barrier because of language, right? Um, maybe some of us may not speak Chinese, can't sing as Mandarin, whatever. And we can't communicate our ideas to them. And I feel like uh, oftentimes if we were to bring them into this conversation or vice versa, I feel like there would be um, a much more unified um, you know, community. Right now, I really do feel like we're being pulled apart um, a bit. And 
Um, you know, and I feel like some, there are some things that we can do today, like right now, to help this community. I mean, you can go to your, um, you know, the place that you go to and you love, and let's say they don't have an English menu, I'm sorry, but maybe they should, because uh, my husband, he can't read Chinese. You know, I can, but he can't. And so that limits him to going into that restaurant or to buying, you know, like a soy milk or something if he doesn't know how to say it in Chinese, right? So, I mean, it's unfortunate, but we do have to adapt with the times. I feel like oftentimes, you know, visitors from Hong Kong and China, they say, oh man, is there any place, uh, a place that's good to eat that has a good environment in Chinatown? And I can only right now think of one or two, you know? And that's really unfortunate. I don't want that to be a representative of us because we should be, we're, our, right now I feel like our development has, is pretty stagnant, right, compared to other Chinatowns. Even in Brooklyn, those fantastic restaurants in Brooklyn. But why not in Chinatown? I mean, I think that everybody must play a part in this. You know, we have to consume in Chinatown. We have to help our neighbors and not just um, be very critical and judgmental, you know. Um, and because rents are high, you know, I can validate my 50 cent ramen right now. Thank you, I appreciate that, Jan. You know, because it's like we, you know, as a community, we do need to support one another. And even if your restaurant that you go to has increased their prices, please don't yell at them and complain, okay? Because our rents are very high, you know? And if we just all support one another in that respect, you know, support our small businesses, support May, you know, buy a few vases, <laughs> you know? I'm serious. I mean, that is um, what's going to help this community um, is everybody's accountability and how you know and how you consume. You know, so if you have um, any skill sets that you want to offer, I mean, you can come to me. Or I'm sure any of us that we're already a part of many organizations. So please offer those to businesses that um, you know are struggling and want to maybe expand online. You know. Um, these are things that are, because I, I like to talk tangible, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not just going to come here and, and preach, but these are, these are things that I hope that you can do um, to, if you, if you feel very, very um, passionate about helping Chinatown, um, and I'm sure all of us can give you many, uh, you know, many tips. But yeah, so going back to the question, in 10 years, I may open another shop. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be in China, but it'll be, I'll still, I'll still be here. I'll just have another one in a different Chinatown. So we want to uh, maybe spend a couple more minutes because we want to let the audience also ask questions. All right, so I'll make, I'll make this brief, but um, thanks for all the, the insight. Um, I mean, I, it definitely inspires me to dig a little deeper and do more research. Um, I, I haven't really ever considered myself on the forefront of activism or on the political scene. Um, so I mean, just, just learning and hearing different sides of, of the story of gentrification and how this is affecting Chinatown is it's very meaningful to me. So um, like you guys, I'm very inspired by it. Um, for me, I guess from a design aspect and why I created this clothing company it, uh, was uh, more on the, uh, on the preservation side. So whether I'm here or I'm not here, um, well, I could provide something that brings people back to a certain type of memory or um, a, a visual, a smell, a taste of Chinatown, I guess is, is more or less my contribution. And if we could inspire those who have left to recall these memories and, and just to inspire them to, to remember uh, a time that once was, I mean, like we talk about people leaving and, and whether or not people stay, um, I guess all it really requires is for me or someone like me to um, want or to need like a washer and dryer in their tenement apartment for them to go and acquire that, to say, hey, look, maybe I do want a one-car garage with a two-story house, and that's enough for them to leave. So um, I'm not sure I'm too political on that front as to the, the driving forces of why people will leave or stay. Um, but for Synonic, what I could hope for is that um, I could touch upon um, memories and, and, and decades of little nuances of the nostalgia of Chinatown that, that if indeed Chinatown does 
change and it is changing that we could recall some of those things, recall some of those businesses, those foods, those times, those memories that, that we had, had as kids and our parents had and our grandparents had and to restore that and to inspire those who have left to just um, pay, pay homage to that. Staying in Chinatown? Ten years from now. Ten years. Ten years from now. I mean, I'd like to be able to be able to still shop at Sophia's store and shop Lexus goods. I think, um, I think there's a. It's difficult though for family-owned businesses to keep going because sometimes they just don't have that extra generation of people. I mean, I know May is like a huge decision for you to take over your family business, but not everyone would do that um, or has the capacity to do it. Um, we've seen what was it called on Mott Street? Um, the, just close, yeah. Um, yeah, Fong and Two, they just closed and they were like the only provider of so many handmade goods that people who go to the cemetery buy every single year and they were just too old. Like they had no one to take over for them. Um, and I think cementing why we stay is just, it's not always a choice, but for the people that do really want to stay close to their family and connected to the community, it's just, oh, I have to do this for the legacy of what we want to keep and the type of like interactions you want to have with people. Like I want to be able to have this small business interaction where like I buy stuff from you and I have this great conversation. I don't want to be buying from a Target. Uh, I don't want to be buying like imitation knockoff ceramics from them um, or anything. But I'd like it if like families could stay here, if people could pass on their rent stabilized apartments to their families without being harassed. Um, so yeah, I just hope that we can still preserve like what's most important, living space and family. Can I add, say, say one quick thing? Is that, um, you know, there's always that when we talk about gentrification, I know it's the topic mostly in, at least in my circles all the time, and people say, oh, it's just inevitable, right? That's just the cycle of how it goes. And it's not inevitable. You know, we are, like you said, agents in, uh, you know, of change, you know, however we choose to, to act accordingly can help determine that, that, that future and that destiny. And so I do feel like it, it, it's absolutely not inevitable. And you see in many ways, even on this panel, the different ways that people are resisting in their own ways. You know, there is obviously direct action ways, but then there's other ways um, where people are preserving their family business, carrying it on, saying, you know, in my own way, you know, I'm not gonna leave, <laughs> you, you can't get me to leave. But I also um, wanna just um, say that there are, you know, I know that, you know, with all this like, you know, talking um, about these, ga these galleries, um, you know, I think that for us, it's, it's a visual, it's, 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 a, it's a visual trigger, right? Because it's so obvious they were there. And I have to say that some of them have been responsive. We put out a pledge. I mean, they've been responsive to the pledge, but haven't done anything, let me just be clear. So our eight point pledge basically has said, you know, you know, support the local businesses that are there. Don't, oh, don't add your footprint. Don't, don't get your, your friends and other people to, to open these hipster bars and things that are not gonna be uh, services, they're not gonna serve the people who live there, right? And also be clear that if you see an empty spot, a vacant spot, Try not, you know, try to, um, um, in, you know, investigate a little bit more. Really easily do Department of Buildings, uh, HPD. Why, why was that? Why was that business let go? Was it because they were evicted, or, or, or because of gentrification and rents going up, or did they leave on their own? So these are these are things that we can just do on our own a little bit. But because these kind of hipster bars and galleries and 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 you know, high-end restaurants are the Trojan horses of, of displacement. We ha do have to kind of look at them and say, you know, you guys have to take a side here. You can't just be a bystander because they, there's a signifier that when they're there, that signifies to all developers, oh, we want more of this, they want more of this. And so I think that it's really important to look at the stratification of, of displacement and all the different agents within it within gentrification and call, you know, do call them out and that there are alternatives and so, not just like you know we we put this for, this this eight point platform out there like be nice to your neighbors you know support local businesses but then also get involved in organizing um, with groups that are fighting gentrification and this Chinatown working group plan and figure out ways to actually push that so that um, everyone can can be protected 
Um, and so I do, you know, want to say that there are there are businesses like up, the ones up here that are aspiring and longtime businesses. But there's also I want to shout out uh, Pro River Mart because Pro River Mart, which many of us might know that um, they were the rent went up <laughs> and they couldn't stay in Soho anymore. Um, their, right, their rent went up to a half a million a month. Um, and now they have a smaller store, which folks should visit, which is on Walker and Broadway. Um, and they have a, gal a gallery space. That is a community gallery space. They had us um, show something, Chinatown Art Brigade. They've had Louis Chan, who is um, a photographer, you know, Corky Lee, folks who, who are it from the community. And so I think that there is another model there. It's not just these galleries uh, are, are, are are showing art and that's why we hate them or we don't like them. We're not anti-art, we're anti-displacement. So I just want to uplift a, a positive, very positive example like Wing Anwa with the WOW Project who's creating community space with, with, with what you all are doing with the WOW Project and places like Pearl River Mart. It's really important that we see examples that we can aspire to or, or, or see replicated. So I just wanted to shout out you all and I want to shout out Pearl River Mart for sure. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna do some rapid fire Q and A right now. Um, what, cool. Maybe we can like get maybe three questions and then we'll answer them consecutively. Yeah, you have your hand up first. Hi, I'm Olivia. Do you want to say your name um, and then your question? Maybe? And, and the people's cultural plan is something 
Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, we definitely know the people, we're aware of the People's Cultural Plan. We're gonna reel it back and kind of answer the first question that was asked by Olympia. Um, and then we'll go to Melissa's and then we'll answer yours, Bob. But we just wanna be aware of the time. So, um, Jen, do you wanna um, kick us I'll, off? I'll try to be brief. I, uh, in, answer to, <clears throat> in answer to your question, what do we do now? Where do we go with the information? I can only answer that the information that I'm gathering is still in process. <clears throat> Excuse me. I started with Mott Street because Mott Street is the core. And one of the things we talked about is there's a lot of pressure coming from architects and city government and to some extent the Chinatown Working Group and uh, city planning that wants to create a landmark district in Chinatown. The landmarking in Chinatown <clears throat> will, I could, I could spend another hour on what landmarking in Chinatown will do, but the landmarking in Chinatown is not a good idea. Um, that's, what the, that's what started me gathering the data. So I wanted to understand what is facing us if we became a landmark district. And what's facing us is those charts, that ever increasing uh, <laughs> climb upward without any increases to, to make up for those climbs, whether it's utilities, whether it's taxes, or whether it's just the, the cost of doing business to maintain. What happens then is flight. The small property owners will leave. And everyone who wants to change Chinatown and do something, they'll be too late. The, the, the changes will happen fast. Chinatown, Mott Street is only owned by a small group of local Chinatown people who are, who've been here for a very long time. When the thread is stretched so far, before it snaps, those people are gonna sell. And the selling has happened already. And the people who are remaining are trying to figure out a way to remain. That prompted me to go to a seminar that was talking about taxes. It was given by the Furman Institute, which is a branch of NYU. The Furman Institute deals specifically with taxes and real estate in New York City. So I intend to take my data to the Furman Institute to use their scholarship, their teachers, and their already produced studies to um, look at us on a, on a very, 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 very concentrated basis and see why is the city doing this, knowing that we are one of the last ethnic enclaves in the city. So um, in addition to the zoning changes that the Chinatown Working Group has proposed, what's missing from that is a discussion about how it sustains itself financially, monetarily, and all of these things in the face of all of these city policies which are only increasing the expense side of the balance sheet. Uh, business Improvement District was the other question. Um, so just a quick answer for all three questions. Um, Olympia, like I do, I think we do need to build new structures. I think there is a huge difference sometimes generation, generationally where we want to pay homage to what's been done and what's already been accomplished and been worked so hard for over years. Um, but a lot of us don't have space too. And I know you've lent space and may lend space. And I think we just need to start from the ground up, which is scary. Um, and I think I think Jan, because you know I've been documenting galleries too, I think we need to find a way to do skill shares between community members so we know where to place these things, how to get these things seen, and maybe how to like use tech to our advantage and make things more um, web and mobile accessible. Um, and for uh, Melissa's question, bids, like when you're participating business in a bid, you're paying a due for certain um, services, so like sanitation, blah, 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 but you can, that becomes like the overriding power, as Jan said. like. Say in Sunset Park, um, bids can decide that they want to kick out a street vendor because you know they belong to the bid, it's their bid, they have control over the street. If they don't want the street vendor there, then they can get rid of them. Or they just the street altogether. Yeah, exactly. Um, and basically it can be really difficult and harassing towards street vendors. I know the street vendor project talks about this a lot. Um, it's because but street vendors provide so many services to working class neighborhoods, right? Like it's where people who walk to work and commute, get their food at a cheap price, and it's made by other people of color. Um, so basically, like bids can use that as like use their bid power as leverage to say they don't want this thing, they don't want this thing, um, and they can use it to like harass other smaller businesses that aren't in the bid. Um, and they're just saying, oh, like we're giving you this these like garbage services, so you should be really happy that we're doing this. Um, and it's just a lot of power play based on what they can say that their bid leverage is. Um, and for Bob's question, yeah, we're very aware of the cultural plan, and I know it just went live, like the website went live this week, I think. So we're trying to 
carefully read through it. I mean, it seems really, really in depth by all the people that have worked on it and people that have already endorsed it. Um, I think we're just looking towards the cultural plan and how it fits into the rezoning plan. Obviously, you, you've been working on this for a long time. But yeah, it's really scary because the cultural plan would put into action a 10 year, right? 10 year, 10 plus year plan of what arts and culture looks like. And we just need to remind them that Chinatown is full of both art and culture, right? Like, we don't need outside, I mean, it's gonna be here anyways, but we don't need like what the city considers art to be placed upon us and then determine, oh, this is what it should look like for 10 years. Um, so we're looking at that very closely and trying to figure out ways to play into that um, very carefully. And there's a lot of really good groups that we know, um, housing, justice people, uh, a lot of other people that are working on it that we're trying to give a lot of time for, but like really careful consideration. So hopefully we'll be looking and reading through it carefully. Um, if people don't know it, it's the People's Cultural Plan. Um, and it's gonna be, it's on the website, is it just peoplesculturalplan.org? Um, and they have a really in-depth breakdown about how the city funds arts in the city, like how it all goes to Manhattan and not to other boroughs, um, and how that feeds and how that feeds into displacement and other things. Um, so you should check it out if you haven't already. Um, I think that's cool. Thank you so much. So I'm going to say really quick thank you. <laughs> thank you so much to our panelists, New York Public Library, to our audience for being such a part of such an important discussion. Diane, my work will continue as we actively explore ways to create access for these oral histories that we've recorded. So stay tuned for more workshops. We're going to the West Coast. We're gonna to try to expand and engage a, li a larger audience. Um, and more immediately, we just wanna invite everybody in the room to our WOW Project one year celebration and fundraiser on May 31st, which is a big um, marker for us and we're excited. Um, so check out our Facebook page for more information. You can come to talk to us after. I've never talked this fast. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.